kid at that time, you were exceptional. I mean, literally, you were the only one. So you had to negotiate that space, particularly when there were all these lyrics that were highlighting the history of white co-option and exploitation of yes. black culture. So, so um, in a number of ways. First of all, by wearing like a Malcolm X hat and t-shirt to every party so that people would ask me what I knew about Malcolm X so that I could tell them, so that I could prove that I was down. And, and the, 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 the sort of pathology of white kids in hip hop at that time was all about being exceptional, being the one cool white kid who was gonna get validated and was always searching for that validation. So that was part of it, was like serially proving that I knew what I was doing, that I deserved to be there. But also hip hop at that time was very much participation and skill based. So if you could do, if you could prove, then you could, you could exist. And I was, I was an MC and I was good, you know, I could rhyme. So it all ultimately came down to that. But there was this sense always of wanting to, of taking very seriously the privilege of being allowed to participate and not wanting to do anything to jeopardize or violate that. And there was a process of separating the political from the personal because... What, is, what do you mean? Well, a, a, a dominant ideology in hip-hop at that time was the 5% ideology, the Nation of Gods and Earths, which is an offshoot of the Nation of Islam, started by Clarence 13X, and, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the elements of the doctrine is the notion that the white man is the devil. Yeah. So, a lot of people that I was friends with subscribed to this, you know, and a lot of rappers used 5%er terminology in their rhymes, people like Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, you know, Brand Newbie, and all of these groups that were very significant and important. And it took me a while to figure out how it was that I could be, you know, the, the white man who's the devil, but also be cool with all these people and spend half my time, like, crashing on their couches. So you learn to sort of find the fault line between the, the political and the personal in the sense that uh, there was this ideology, there was this rubric, but there was also a way through your own actions to perhaps transcend that in a way that was maybe more complicated for you than for anybody else. Right. I want to ask about how that relates to your writing. I mean, we a lot of women authors write in the point of view of male characters, and some male writers write in the point of view of female characters, but you get very, very few white writers writing from the point of view of black characters. They're more likely to write about characters from outer space or a 15th century nobleman mm -hmm. than they are to adopt black voices. Mm -hmm. Why that anxiety? I mean, you do it. You've done it. I, you know, I've done it in a, in a limited kind of way. I mean, the narrator of Angry Black White Boy is a white kid. Um, and in, in a sense, that's my attempt to remix the American race novel by making it about whiteness, which when you talk about race in America, really we should be talking about whiteness. That's the essential construct that has caused the rest of these problems. Um, Dondi, as you know, is, is a biracial kid and a kind of mover between different worlds and rages back. Um, I think there's a lot of anxiety because any time you're moving from the center to the margins in terms of privilege, uh, you want to be very careful. And I think for a lot of white writers, that just results in paralysis or an inability to, to even attempt it. My feeling is that if you're going to be a male writer writing a female character, a straight character writing a gay character, a white character writing a non-white character, the stakes are just higher. You just have to pull it off convincingly that much more. 